okay. <laughs> then I hope that more forks will sh uh, shuffle in uh, while we go. Good. Uh, so today we will look at the uh, so-called SLAM problem, simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, um, yeah, uh, which is a bit in contrast to what we uh, looked at last week, because last week we were focusing on cameras as the main sensor, and SLAM um, looks at this problem more from the robotics uh, point of view uh, with uh, laser scanners, but also with uh, different, uh, a co combination of, of multiple sensors. Um, so uh, this is the agenda for today. We will first look briefly at Ransack. Have you, or how many of you have seen Ransack before somewhere? Okay, roughly half, so then, then it's good that we review it again. Um, then we will look at laser-based motion estimation in contrast to vision-based motion estimation from last week. Then we will look at the SLAM problem and at the post-graph uh, SLAM uh, problem. And uh, finally, at uh, how to optimize maps uh, doing that. And um, yeah, good. So, um, to, to motivate the, the RANSAC uh, problem, again, uh, remember the eight-point algorithm from last week. We were looking at two, two camera images, um, and we used the eight-point algorithm to uh, estimate the camera motion. Uh, that means the rotation and the translation up to scale between these two images. And the algorithm worked as follows. We had to find at least eight correspondences. From this, we could estimate the projection matrix between the two images. Um, and, and then we could extract, or sorry, we could estimate the essential matrix and from there extract uh, rotation and translation. And um, I already indicated this. Uh, so when you find, when you try to find correspondences, then most of them will be fine, hopefully. But there will always be some outliers that are just bad associations, where the descriptors look ex extremely similar, but uh, in the end, it's not a, a, a real match. And now the problem is that we have to find eight in layers from the set to be able to estimate the rotation and translation correctly. Um, if you use all of these correspondences, including the outliers, uh, then uh, usually you get a very bad estimate. And uh, to see why this happens, let's look at uh, a simpler problem first. Uh, imagine that we have um, these 2D points here and we want to fit a line to them. Um, and um, in this case, uh, or in, actually in most cases, you um, can assume that the input data is a mixture of some inliers um, that have ga Gaussian noise around them uh, and some pure outliers that, that don't make sense at all. So that are just bad observations from your sensor. And um, if, you, if you fit a line to, the, to these points using least squares, then uh, probably you will get a line model like this out of it um, because you know, it, it tries to minimize, uh, it tries to find a line where the quadratic distance of the points to the line uh, is minimal. And this means that points that are very far away <laughs> have a strong influence because of this quadratic penalty. And this will shift the line towards these outlier points. And at the end, this estimate of the line is, um, uh, yeah, is really, really bad. And uh, th this um, um, and, and this kind of problem appears everywhere, essentially, where you have outlier contaminated data. And this RANSAC algorithm uh, is, is a really famous algorithm um, uh, that uh, can deal with this. And the idea is as follows. Um, uh, you, you have, so you have this huge input data, um, and, uh, but from, from there you only select a minimal subset that is just enough to estimate your model parameters. So in the case of the line, that would be uh, two points, because from two points you can estimate a line, and that's it. So and then from these two points you yeah, try to fit the line model, for example, and then using this model you classify all points in inliers and outliers, whether or not they comply to this model, um, and then you you know, repeat that for a number of times, and um, uh, from the model that you instantiated that has the largest number of inliers, um, you refit it again. And just to, to illustrate how this uh, really looks like, imagine we draw two points. For example, we draw these two points by chance. Uh, we fit a line. This is a, already a good fit in principle, um, but it it's not, you can see that if we would fit it, it should be a little bit uh, above. But this is what, you know, what, uh, the, what we get from the two sample points. And, um, um, and then you determine using this model um, whether or not a point is an inlier or an outlier. So in this case, so, so you would uh, have a certain distance threshold, for example, and then count everything as an inlier that is closer than the threshold and everything else as an outlier. Um, 
Good. Then you repeat this again. Maybe you sample these two points here. Um, this would give you this a line like this. This would mean that these points would um, uh, uh, still count as inliers, but everything else would be regarded as an, an outlier. And that means that in this iteration, we found a model that has five inliers and seven outliers. So it's slightly worse. And then we sample again, and maybe we <laughs> instantiate this model here. Uh, and that has only two inliers and, and ten out, uh, t t two inliers and ten outliers. So this means that the best model that we have sampled so far was the one from these two points. And um, uh, we know now that all of these points are inliers, so we can do another. So um, is, is now we can refine the model uh, using using least squares, and that gives us then this red line. And um, yeah, uh, is, uh, yeah. And th now this estimate is still least squares on the inliers, um, but it is uh, robust against the outliers because these were excluded in the estimation process. Is this cl clear so far how this goes? And you can imagine that you know this is now for a line. So here we sample two points, but you could do the same with eight points, of course. Um, yeah. The only difference with eight points is that uh, the probability of uh, getting you know drawing uh, eight points that are all in liars is of course much lower. Um, and it uh, and there is a and this influences the number of times that you have to sample from the model. So there is a formula uh, with which you can compute how many iterations in Ransack you need, uh, given that. Um, you have a subset size of, uh, of a certain size, for example, of two or of eight, uh, a certain outlier ratio, and um, you want to look at a certain probability of success of drawing an inlier. For example, a reasonable number would be to choose uh, the probability of success to be 99%. You know that, that between two images, say, you want to have a 99% chance of finding an inlier set, uh, and we assume that we have 10% outliers, and we need eight points, then we would have to do nine iterations of Ransack. So that's pretty fast. But you can also see that when the outlier ratio is maybe 50%, which is really, really bad, uh, then you would already have to sample uh, more than 1,000 times. So this number can grow quickly. Good. So to, to, to summarize this, um, uh, Ransack is a really efficient algorithm to estimate a model if you have uh, outliers in your data. Um, and it's used very, very widely for all kinds of things. And we'll, I'll show later an example uh, uh, how, yeah, where, where it can be used. But for example, it can, it's used a lot for uh, visual motion estimation with uh, the eight-point algorithm. Um, good. Um, and there are lots of different uh, variants and improvements um, yeah, on, on this uh, to, to refine it. Good. So as I said, today we will look at laser-based motion estimation or depth-based uh, motion estimation. Um, and um, as you know from the second lecture, we, uh, there are different uh, sensors that provide depth. Um, for example, this is a SIG laser scanner, and it's used a lot in industry and on industrial robots um, because it has certain guarantees what it sees and what it can't see. Um, so this is so laser scanners are um, safety approved. So whenever you have a person standing in front of the laser scanner, you're guaranteed to detect the person. Um, uh, there are also ultrasound sensors like we have on the um, uh, AR drone um, and um, time of flight cameras uh, that measure that have in a similar principle as the laser scanner. Um, so the laser scanner in principle only measures the distance to a point and then it has a rotating uh, mirror that you can uh, measure the, the, the distances um, um, in, in a plane. And this time of flight cameras do it for every pixel so you get uh, uh, distance measurements for every pixel. And then there is the Kinect um, that is more based on a stereo principle um, and um, that we will look at uh, next week how, how, it, how it works. But in principle all of these sensors give you um, depth images, either a line or a point <laughs> or, um, or a full image. And there is one um, last uh, new idea that, that I wanted to show you and that's uh, built into this uh, vacuum cleaning robot here, uh, which is called laser triangulation. Um, so maybe I should say that uh, a laser scanner or in particular or, or more generally everything that measures the time of light of, of light is, is relatively expensive um, because uh, the time period that you have to measure is so small that your electronics need to be really good and really sensitive. Um, but uh, a few years ago um, uh, um, Kurt Connolich came up with this idea to do laser triangulation. Uh, the idea is that you have a very well-defined light pattern like a 
point, for uh, like a laser pointer, um, and uh, you observed. So this laser pointer is pointing to to the wall, for example, and then slightly displaced. You have a camera that's looking at this point and measures the angle to the point, and. Um, by using simple triangulation, you can then estimate the depth. So the idea is as follows. You have a, have a laser. It's pointing to the wall. Um, it hits somewhere the wall. And then we have a line camera, for example, or a position sensitive device that uh, tells us you know, uh, at which pixel we see this point. And then, um, of course, the further the wall is away, uh, the, uh, the smaller the displacement here will be on the sensor. And in this way, we can estimate uh, the depth uh, directly by this, uh, yeah, fr fr from, the, from the disparity. And um, this, um, this is, of course, much cheaper than a real laser scanner, uh, because on, you only need a laser pointer, which is really cheap. And you need a camera that can observe this point. And, um, and this is what's used in, this, in, in the NITU vacuum cleaning robot. So it, it has a laser. You can also, when you, when you want, you can later look at this. Uh, so here is the, the laser inside. Um, it um, um, measures only a point, uh, but it, this is mounted on a rotating uh, plate. And in this way, uh, the laser scanner can see more or less 360 degrees. Um, and, and building such a device is super cheap because you only need the laser and the camera, and, uh, this is, and, and therefore it makes sense to integrate it in a consumer device like a vacuum cleaning robot that you can buy for 300 euros, approximately. So the data is not as good as uh, uh, from a real laser scanner, but nevertheless um, good enough to do mapping. And um, this is now the robot. This is a video from Nito on YouTube where you can see how the robot um, drives around in an, in an apartment and uh, does mapping. And um, you can also see a person here occasionally walking around uh, the legs, which are, you could say, outliers in principle for uh, the purpose of localization. Uh, you can also see how these, um, so, so the, the blue points are the points that the laser scanner actually sees. And from these points, it tries to estimate uh, the map of the apartment, and it tries to estimate its, its own position. So here you can see the, the person again, the legs of the person uh, while, while walking around. And uh, today we will look at uh, how to um, estimate the robot position from such laser measurements. Good. Uh, in any case, independent of what laser scanner or sensor you use, um, a laser scanner usually provides you with um, um, uh, with distances uh, and uh, uh, independency of a certain angle. So you get a, um, a sequence of angles and distances um, in, in this direction. And uh, a typical laser scanner maybe does uh, 200, uh, maybe 270 or um, 360 uh, measurements in, uh, and has an opening angle of maybe 180 or 270 degrees. And um, of course, you can um, represent this either as uh, angles and distances, or you can represent it as uh, points in x and y direction, of course, which is the same. And uh, in this representation, it's called a point cloud or a point set, because you have 2D points or potentially 3D points um, yeah, that are unordered. Um, good. And then, of course, you can, uh, again, uh, estimate or uh, um, um, uh, design a, a probabilistic sensor model that tells you which measurement you expect given that um, you know that uh, the real distance um, has a particular value. So, for example, imagine that we, have, we are looking at a wall with such a scanner, and um, the wall has a distance of, say, two meters, so that would be here. Um, then, of course, uh, we would expect that our sensor gives us back this reading uh, with the highest probability or somewhere close to this, so that it has something like a Gaussian shape. Uh, but, of course, it can also happen that, that we sometimes get uh, closer measurements <laughs> For reasons, uh, for, for lots of reasons, either because it's just a bad measurement of the sensor, but it could also happen that somebody or something is walking in front of the robot and then produces bad measurements. It's also part of the noise that, that you have expect. And it can also happen that the sensor um, does not see anything or uh, gives you back a, a max, range, max range reading, for example, because uh, the robot is looking at um, a reflective surface like a mirror or, you know, or something that is extremely dark where it can't get a measurement. And then uh, it would assume that it's infinitely far away <laughs> and, um, uh, and then potentially deliver you a max range. Good. 
Um, okay, and now the question is how can we uh, align two laser scans? And um, uh, as you remember from, from uh, two weeks ago, I think, uh, when we looked at how to align 2D image patches, you remember that one option is always to do an exhaustive search. Right? You can try all possible combinations of orientations and positions and find the one that best aligns. Um, th that can be slow, so, and th this is why uh, another algorithm is, has, is really famous for point cloud alignment and that's called um, uh, iteratively closest point. Um, so let's first look at the exhaustive search problem. Um, in, 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 in principle, you have to do a correlation between the two scans, and uh, the way how you can do that um, is to use the first scan to, to estimate um, um, a map, an occupancy grid map. We will look next week how this, how this um, looks like exactly. And then based on this uh, occupancy grid map, or this likelihood map, we can um, compute the correlation and then select the position and uh, um, rotation that, that maximizes the observation likelihood again. So, yeah. And um, while this is in practice usually too, too much to compute, uh, there was uh, a few years ago at ICRA this nice uh, paper and video where somebody really um, uh, uh, evaluated this so it, um, um, uh, in, in real time on a GPU. So the, the thing is, you know, in, in, in 2D or in, a, in an image plane, and this is where all of these laser scanner uh, robots usually operate, uh, it has only three degrees of freedom. And three degrees of freedom are, uh, you know, a lot to evaluate on a CPU, but if you have a GPU with maybe 400 processors that can do things in parallel, it becomes actually feasible to compute uh, this uh, correlative scan matching in real time. And um, the cool thing then is on this video that you can see, let, let, let me explain maybe. So we have, um, so, so in, 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 for this video they assume that they have a, a, um, the full map already, and they, but they want to know where the robot could be in this map. And then depending on its location, you get a heat map like this, and um, in this case the robot is most likely to be, lo to be located here. Um, and. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just let it run. Um, and the, the nice thing is that sometimes you see that this is a, a really nice circular spot, which means that the robot is really well localized and that the place is distinctive. Uh, but it can also happen that the robot drives into a corridor and then its, its position is not so, so much uh, constrained. And, um, um, yeah, and then the robot in principle doesn't know so exactly where it, where it comes from. And of course you can always approximate this whole likelihood here with the Gaussian distribution and say, you know, we'll, you'll skip everything and just approximate it locally. Um, but it's also nice sometimes to, to just look at uh, how the real likelihood map looks like. Do you, can everybody read this heat map? Okay, good. So you see in a corridor like this, uh, the robot is really uncertain about its motion in the forward direction because the corridor everywhere looks the same. And this is of course something that you have to uh, take on, into account uh, later when you, when you build the map and when you, yeah, when you, when you update your state estimate. Yes? So in this case, when the robot, for example, is in front of the wall, but it has a big corridor behind it, mm -hmm. it also uh, uh, has a complete line. Uh, then it should be well constrained. Um, it's usually only if it can't see far enough. Wait, let's maybe let's pause here. So in this case, the robot ah, probably the, the laser scanner only looks to the front. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly about the opening angle of the laser scanner. But if it if it would be a 360 degree opening, then it could still see the structure here, and then it should be well constrained. Um, but it, it knows that it has to be in the corridor, but it can't tell by how far. So in this case, it can be anywhere in the corridor. It knows for sure that it's not outside of the corridor. So here you can see that the likelihood decreases because here it would expect different measurements. Good. Um, yeah, and then the next question, of course, is would this also generalize to, to 3D? This is now data from, um, uh, from a car with a, a Velodyne laser scanner on top of it. Uh, this is what the Google car uses. So you have this rotating laser scanner with 64 beams, and um, it rotates 10 times a second and gives you, spits out lots of points. Uh, do you think you could do correlative scan matching as well in 3D? Any intuition? Would that work? Would that not work? How many degrees of freedom do you have in 3D? <laughs> 60? 
six. Yeah. So so probably going through all of these six dimensions uh, in a brute force way uh, would be really costly. Um, and this, this means that we need to do that we need a different uh, minimization technique and and one of them or actually the most famous one is called iteratively uh, closest point ICP um, for the moment uh, we assume that we have so we have two point clouds uh, that we want to align and for the moment we assume that they are already ordered so that we know that the first point corresponds to the second point um, um, in, in general, you know, if you do a scan and the robot is slightly rotated, then of course you don't know which points are associated. And also it could happen that one of the scans has more points than the other scan, <laughs> and vice versa, or that, that they don't overlap 100%. Um, but in, in any case, so you have as input two point clouds, and we want to compute the translation and rotation such that um, these point clouds uh, align as good as possible. And this alignment uh, can be expressed as follows. Um, so we can say that, you know, the, the second point, the first point minus the transformed second point should be as close together as possible. So we have P minus the rotated point minus the translation. And then here, the, just the Euclidean distance between the two should be minimized over all points. Right, so that intuitively ma makes sense. Um, what's not so intuitive at the first, um, 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 how do you say, it? Uh, at the first look, is that um, there is actually a closed form solution to compute it if you have good correspondences, um, and this works as follows. Um, first, you can compute the translation just by bringing the center of masses of both point, cl point clouds in correspondence. So you, you can compute the center of mass from the first point cloud, and you can compute the center of mass of the second point cloud, and then uh, you know that both point clouds have to have the same center of mass, because otherwise they wouldn't be um, yeah, they wouldn't align properly. Um, and in this way, we can directly recover the translation just by subtracting these two. So, so after we subtract it, we know that both point clouds are zero centered, and uh, the only thing that remains is that we have to estimate the rotation. And um, it turns out that uh, you can uh, directly compute the rotation by computing the um, um, uh, co covariance uh, between these two point sets. So you take the first point minus, so the, in principle, the zero centered points times the zero standard points from the second point cloud give you a matrix W, and you can decompose that using singular value decomposition. And then this, um, in principle, this W is directly your rotation matrix if you don't have noise. But if you have noise, then the eigen, um, the singular values might not be one. So if you just leave them out, you directly get the rotation matrix. The proof is a little bit complicated, so I left it out here. Um, but it's important to remember that you can directly find the translation and the rotation just by, you know, in closed form, just by looking at the points. Um, good. But of course, in general, you don't have good correspondences, as I said. And uh, then what you can do is to guess correspondences by some means, uh, use that to compute the transformation. The transformation by itself will be optimal, but because the correspondences were partially wrong, uh, it won't give you the perfect alignment afterwards, but it will hopefully bring the second point cloud closer to the first point cloud, and then you can do that again and again until it hopefully <laughs> converges uh, to the right uh, um, alignment. Um, and this is the ICP algorithm. It um, usually, so it's used a lot in practice, and it converges very well when the starting position is close enough. So it's a local search, and um, when you have ambiguities, uh, it, or it, it will end up in, it might end up in a local minima, or it's more or less guaranteed to end up in a, in a local minimum. And if you, only if you're close enough to the real minimum, then you'll find the global one. But you, you don't have any guarantees on this. Good. Just to illustrate how this how this looks like, this iterative process. This is this, these are different scans taken in a in a mine um, from a mining vehicle, um, and um, there is so there is one scan taken by the laser scanner, and then the vehicle went a little bit further, took another scan, and um, and every scan is then aligned iteratively to this existing point cloud, and every time ICP converges the Current, the new point cloud is added to the first point cloud, and in this way, you, you build up a point, a large point cloud that is aligned. Good. Yes? Uh, the, the, the uh, I'll come to that in a second. <laughs> um, 
So um, there are lots of different parameters where you can tune things. For example, you, there are different ways to find the correspondences, but you can also select and weight the source points. Um, uh, you can reject certain correspondences, um, and uh, there are different choices for the error metric and different ways to do the minimization. And I'll walk through all of these points now. Um, and depending on these choices that you that you do, you get uh, the difference uh, in performance. So sometimes you really need fast, uh, a fast convergence, uh, but you don't care too much about accuracy. Um, sometimes you want to, um, yeah, in, in, along the same line. Sometimes you want to be, have a stable result. Um, uh, um, yeah, they also have. In, this also has, has influence on the number of noise and outliers that you can deal with, um, um, which you can also see then in the Besson of convergence. That is, if you look at the energy function, you know how shaky and how noisy it looks like, depending on uh, on your choices. Uh, good. For, so for selecting the source points, tr typically you would say all points or the, all data that you have should be used. So you would use all points, but that could be uh, a lot, and that could make your algorithm run so slowly that um, uh, that you yeah that that you that you prefer actually to do random sampling from from this initial point cloud. For example, the Velodyne produces one million points per second, and uh, to find correspondences between you know twice one million points um, can take uh, yeah can take a while um, so then it makes so sometimes people just downsample point clouds to 10,000 points maybe and then do the alignment there and maybe just do a refinement then on the full point clouds um, the, uh, there is also um, yeah, you can also have a spatially uniform subsampling. Uh, I'll show you brief, uh, shortly what it means. And you can also extract features, uh, like we had it last week, uh, of, uh, because some points maybe are more informative than others. So uh, the spatially uniform sampling uh, means the following. For example, if you have a Velodyne laser scanner, then objects that are closer to the car uh, will have more sample points, of course, because, you, because they are closer. And... Um, um, and, and this means that uh, there might be a certain bias uh, for ICP to align the points. For example, you see these rings here, and the rings are relatively far away, and then ICP might be tempted to align the rings instead of aligning the world. <laughs> You know, because ICP mostly sees the rings, and then if if the motion between uh, between two frames is smaller than the distance between the rings, then maybe ICP would lock onto the the rings. And to prevent that, um, it would make sense to um, to downsample uh, the point cloud spatially, so that you have say one point per square meter or ten points per square meter, something like this, independent of the actual position of the car. Um, good. Um, as I said, you can also pre-process um, uh, 3D scans by extracting um, interest points in 3D. Uh, for example, this is the original point cloud that has 200,000 points, and you might happen that 200,000 is too much for your computer that you have on the robot. Um, and so you can um, uh, yeah, uh, de decrease, de decrease this number by extracting features, for example, um, uh, points where the curvature changes a lot, or uh, points where you um, um, yeah, have, have certain properties that, that you find interesting, for example, lines or uh, corners uh, in, in, in this 3D point cloud. Um, good. Uh, advantage is that, uh, of course, you have less points afterwards, but uh, on the other hand, you need to do some pre processing, with, which again costs time. And um, yeah, so there is a certain trade off on how to do that. And you lose a little bit of accuracy because you uh, remove points. Good. And now we come to the uh, matching of, of points. Um, the, the easiest idea is to uh, just find the, the nearest neighbors uh, from for, for, for each point in the in the second uh, point set. So, for for example, for this point, you would choose this point because it's the, it has the it's the closest. Um, and um, usually, it makes then sense to have a distance threshold to say you know points that are too far away between two point clouds won't be considered at all. Um, yeah, uh, and it could happen, you know, that a second point here, um, say, say here, maybe would get assigned to the same same point, and then you would have to make a choice. Either you allow that points can have can be associated to the same point, or you say only the nearest one gets assigned. Um, 
so this is this is the default more or less when you look at ICP implementations. Um, it gives um, good results, uh, but it can be slow to compute. And um, one one op one way to to speed up this uh, correspondence search um, with nearest neighbors is to build up uh, an, an index uh, like a KD tree, you know, or an, an OC tree uh, that you can quickly access uh, the nearest neighbor in the first or in the second point cloud. The disadvantage is that um, building up the KD tree is again costly, or it can be costly. Um, so you have to again see whether or not it pays off to to build up such an uh, such an index. There is also a simpler algorithm called protection-based matching, uh, and um, that's also used a lot in practice. And I'll show you next week a nice example of um, how this works in 3D with Kinect data. Um, it's, it's an approximation of the nearest neighbor, um, so it's in slightly worse than if you would compute the right, the, 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 the real um, uh, nearest neighbor, uh, but it's, much, it's way faster than uh, computing the real nearest neighbor. Um, the, the idea is as follows. So instead of, um, so in principle, you, you're looking for a nearest neighbor of this point here. And um, so, so this, so I should say there are two laser scanners. The one, first one sees this, um, uh, this surface here, and the second one sees this surface here. And now we are trying to associate points from the red uh, line to points on the blue line. And uh, instead of looking for the really, Short, uh, nearest neighbor. We just look al along the line of sight of the second camera and then directly take uh, the, the uh, point that we find along the line of sight. Um, and that's a super simple computation, of course, because we just need to project this point into this camera and then look up uh, what depths we've seen here and then this is our association. Um, you, I mean, uh, intuitively, when you look at it, you think that this gives a much worse performance. But when these two cameras are really, really close together, then this is a r relatively good approximation. And this is called projection-based matching. Good. Uh, and then the last point, or the second to last point, is uh, that we need to define an error metric that we try to minimize. In the formula in the beginning, I had this point-to-point -point distance, where we just assume that we want to minimize the Euclidean distance between two points. Um, um, it it's, depends on your, on your data and your application, um, but uh, the point, point to plane metric is also really popular and uh, can give uh, you better results if you're if you if you have many uh, planar surfaces in your world. And that's usually you know in indoor environments you always have planes. Uh, the idea is as follows: you know the, the point to distance metric would would be um, would be this distance that we try to minimize, but it could happen that we are are looking at a wall in one scan and a wall in a second scan and that our sample points actually come from different positions on the wall. So, um, you know, the point-to-point -point metric would move this green point to this point, but it might actually be sufficient if this green point would, would, um, would be moved somewhere on the wall because this is uh, what we are looking at. And if you, um, depending on your data, if it's okay to uh, assume, assume that you are that your world is locally planar. Uh, then you can compute the point-to-plane metric. Um, and um, yeah, in an even more generalized way, you can say that every point has an associated covariance metric, metric in which it um, tells uh, you how. Uh, whether or not it is constrained and in which directions it is, is constrained. For example, points on um, on a plane would have a covariance ellipse that is very broad, you know, where points can slide in this direction. And um, uh, yeah, p points that are on a corner would have a, either a tilted ellipse or a much smaller ellipse uh, to indicate that they are much more constrained. And um, so this generalized ICP algorithm, for example, which was presented a few years ago at RSS, um, uh, assigns a covariance matrix to every point and tries to estimate, first estimate this covariance matrix from the data, uh, and then use that during the minimization. It's important to know that uh, this closed form solution that uh, <laughs> I, I presented uh, in the beginning only works for the point to point metric. And whenever you have um, something else, uh, then uh, you uh, need to run uh, any other nonlinear mini uh, minimization, iterative minimization algorithm like gradient descent, Gauss Newton, or uh, Levenberg Marquardt. Um, and this is uh, uh, now a nice demo video that uh, somebody did uh, uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, it, it demonstrates uh, how that um, 
that um, 2D point, uh, 3D point clouds can be aligned in real time at that time, and this means that today it's possible at even you know five times the speed. Um, uh, uh, this this guy had to build uh, his own uh, depth camera because at that time there was of course no time of flight cameras that you could buy for a reasonable price or uh, there was no Kinect. So he used a projector and a camera, camera and used temporal coding. I'll show you next week what that means. But in principle he gets again a de depth image out of it and uh, then every depth image is aligned to the um, previous point cloud and uh, when the convergence has finished it... Um, wait, oh start it again. When convergence has finished, it adds it to the point cloud. And this way you can see how the turtle is built up. Um, yeah. Good. And you can see how accurate it is because you can see the, uh, the structure here of the, the turtle. Good. So ICP is a really powerful algorithm and widely used algorithm to calculate the displacement between point clouds. Um, and um, there are several parts of the algorithm that cost time, but the most important part is the matching or the uh, finding the correspondences between the point clouds. Um, and important, <laughs> ICP is uh, only locally optimal. So it depends on your starting location, and especially when you are too far off, uh, then ICP generally doesn't give you good results. So as a rule of thumb, maybe ICP needs uh, to be as close as 30 degrees between the two scans. If you're far further away, if you're 180 degrees away, it will never <laughs> Uh, be able to turn the model around just because you're doing locally assigning and um, uh, yeah, minimizing the distances. Good. Uh, yes? Uh, it depends on your data. I mean, if you, in, in principle, you would just use the nearest neighbor, I guess, to begin with. Um, but if you have, for example, if you have Kinect data, then all of your uh, points have color additionally. And then you could say, um, uh, I don't, not only want to find the nearest neighbor, but I want to find the nearest neighbor that has the same color. And then this would be a second term. It makes, again, the finding the correspondences more complicated, <laughs> um, even more slower. But maybe the, uh, but then the, the matching gets uh, more accurate because you, your correspondences are more accurate. And you could even have um, extract uh, from the color images um, uh, sift features, for example, and then match the sift features. And then you have a really good then, then you maybe only have 100 matches between the two point clouds, but you know that most of them are really accurate. Um, but it, it depends on what sensor you have. So when people have laser scanners, they usually just use the closest point. Um, but when you have Kinect, then maybe uh, feature-based approaches uh, give, give higher accuracies. And are also faster <laughs> in the end. Um, good. So... Um, so, so this is now, was now another method to estimate the motion between two frames if you have laser data. Uh, and now we want to use um, these motion estimates, either from lasers or from vision, to, to build a map of the environment. And SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, which means that the robot needs to uh, infer its, its location in a map and at the same time has to estimate this map um, um, uh, yeah, for given uh, given its location or its previous previous locations. Um, so SLAM is, is really a central problem that's used a lot for everything <laughs> in, in robotics. Um, uh, for in, in your exercise, in exercise two, you assume that you have that you have the map. You know that you know the marker positions on the floor and you hard coded it in the Kalman filter that it that it knows about it. But in the general case, uh, you, you don't have markers and you don't know about the map. Um, for example, vacuum cleaning robots need to do that. Um, I'll show you. A, uh, yeah, you, you, I show you another video of that. Um, of course, also for uh, quadrocopters, usually you have to build up the map by yourself, um, and all ki kinds of other uh, robots where you don't have good maps uh, beforehand. So, so this is uh, the the Samsung. Um, um, a uh, housing robot that has a camera that's looking to the ceiling. Um, and uh, while it goes, it extracts um, simple features from visual features like SIFT, for example, and then uses triangulation to, to estimate their, uh, their depth. And, um, and in this way, the, the robot builds up uh, a visual map of its uh, environment. And um, 
you can here see on the right side um, the, the estimated position of the robot. Um, the features above, they are a bit hard to see. And whenever the robot bumps into an obstacle, it, uh, it also notes on the map that, they are, that uh, this, this cell was not um, accessible or that it was in collision. And um, in this way, the robot can build up um, a complete map of the environment and it can, um, in a structured way, um, clean, clean the apartment. Um, yeah. Only disadvantage is that this robot can't really see the obstacles, so it, it really has to bump into all objects, uh, objects at least once, <laughs> um, which is okay, I guess, for, for cleaning, because you anyway need to go everywhere. Um, but for creating a map, this is, might not be the most efficient, <laughs> more, most efficient way. What? what? Yeah, especially not with a quadrocopter, <laughs> right? Um, but this map has two parts. So there is this feature-based map above, where uh, it tries to estimate the features, um, and uh, the obstacle map that it builds using the tactile sensor. Um, this is now a video from the, um, from the NITO robot. Uh, and uh, when you have a laser scanner, you, of course, already know where the obstacles are. Um, so you, you do both at the same time. You estimate the environment map in 2D, and um, you get an occupancy grid map out of it, which allows you to uh, accurately cover um, uh, the middle part of the uh, apartment uh, very efficiently without having to bump every, everywhere. So, so, so in, in a few weeks, I'll explain you, um, I'll show you some coverage or, and path planning algorithms, um, which is a problem that, you know, given a map, you want to find a trajectory that brings you everywhere. Um, um, uh, yeah, that, that covers, covers the whole surface, but minimizes the, the length of the trajectory. And this is, of course, what you have to do if you want to clean an apartment, or if uh, you are a quadrocopter and you need to, to so, um, survey uh, a certain area. Good. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, there, is, um, uh, uh, there are these two um, uh, concepts called uh, structure from motion that we looked at last week, um, and uh, SLAM, which is called simultaneous localization and mapping. And uh, structure from motion generally deals with the problem that you only have camera images as the input, either monocular or stereo images. And um, sometimes um, it, is, it even assumes that you don't have uh, calibrated sensors. So sometimes people download from Flickr tons of images and then build um, uh, nice maps from, um, yeah, from cities. Um, SLAM, on the other hand, is more related to robotics, where you have um, multiple sensors like laser scanners. You could also have cameras or GPS or ultrasound. And um, most important is that you typically have an odometry sensor that gives you the translation or that gives you the motion between two consecutive uh, frames. Um, and usually you, you have pre-calibrated sensors. Um, yeah. So, so this is, yeah, in, in principle, they, both of these um, uh, concepts are dealing with the same, um, same underlying problem, but on, in structure for motion, the focus is more on cameras, while SLAM uh, usually combines more sensors. Um, before we start with the SLAM problem, um, uh, remember again that we had different representations for 3D transformations. Um, the uh, one that, that you have used um, now uh, is uh, a homogeneous transformation matrix, where you have a rotation matrix and a translation vector. Um, the good thing is it's, it's easy to concatenate and invert. Um, the disadvantage is that it's not minimal. So it has 12 degrees of freedom or 16 degrees of freedom. Um, and so it's not optimal for optimization. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you, you remember that there have been d different ways like quaternions and Euler angles um, that uh, 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 have less degrees of freedom and are better to optimize. And uh, today, uh, I, uh, um, we, we assume that we are given twist coordinates. And twist coordinates uh, are a six-dimensional vector that encodes velocities. So we have a linear velocity that corresponds more or less to the translation, and an angular velocity that encodes uh, the rotation. Uh, in this representation, the advantage of this representation is that it's minimal, um, but it's more complicated to conca conca concatenate it uh, and invert it, because we need to go to the matrix representation first, uh, then do our computations, and then convert it back. Um, this um, angular velocity uh, has the following meaning. Um, remember that you can represent a rotation by a rotation axis and a rotation angle. And um, this generally has four degrees of uh, four parameters because you have the axis, which has, has three 
degrees of freedom and the rotation around this axis. And now if you say that this, um, uh, uh, this axis here has unit length, we can actually multiply the angle with the unit length and then in this way we, we get a, a vector of length 3. Right? And no rotation then in this representation would mean a vector of 0, 0, 0. Um, and uh, a rotation of um, 360 degrees would be a vector of length 2, 2p. And, um, the, yeah. and then in this representation, the length is the rotation angle, and, um, and this is also called the angular velocity. And it is a minimal representation for rotations. And this is convenient to use, but uh, other people use unit quaternions and uh, works as well. Good. There are some uh, co um, transformations between this minimal representation and um, um, uh, the matrix. Um, uh, you can, uh, in MATLAB, you can direct, you can build up this um, so-called twist uh, here, uh, and then uh, a computer matrix exponential to to um, to give you the the four by four matrix. And again, you can uh, uh, draw the logarithm um, to compute it. Um, there are also more direct formulas to do that. It's not super, or it's not. It's not really important how to compute that exactly, but just to remember that there is, there are usually functions <laughs> to convert between both of them. Good, and uh, this means um, so. In the following, I will uh, represent a camera pose uh, with a small letter C, camera pose one to camera pose n, and there are of course corresponding transformation matrices M1 to Mn, and um, these transformation matrices consists of a rotation and a translation, um, so we could also denote it like this, just to prevent confusion in the following. Um, good. So, so far we um, have now looked at methods to compute um, the relative motion between two frames, um, for example using ICP. So we have two spots uh, where we took scans or where we took an image, and uh, we have a method that gives us back the relative transformation between these two cameras. And um, yeah, and um, now um, yeah, let, let me first introduce uh, the so-called motion composition operator, which allows us to concatenate motions. In principle, this means that we have to go from this camera pose to the transformation matrix, um, multiply it. You know, we, so, so it, it just means we, we have a camera pose somewhere in space and we have a relative motion and we attach it to each other. We do that by taking the exponential, for example, when we are dealing with twists, multiply it and, and draw again the logarithm. This is what it means, just concatenates the two motions. And um, yeah, and while we go, for example, with uh, with the robot looking in this direction, uh, we can concatenate and concatenate, <laughs> and uh, compute in this way. So, given the first camera pose and all the relative motions, we can of course compute the following camera poses. Now, of course, it could happen that when we go around the object of interest, um, that we again um, come close to our first camera position. And then we could actually run our motion estimation algorithm also in this direction. You know, we could compare these two scans. And then, uh, and then maybe <laughs> we find that the camera pose that we estimate from this direction is actually not the same as the one that we estimate in this direction, right? And the reason for that is obviously that all estimates are a little bit noisy, and the longer you go, the more, um, the more drift you will accumulate, and, um, and that we need, need a way to, to compensate for this. And, um, well, no, uh, yeah, so, so uh, um, in any case, it means that um, we, um, yeah, uh, yeah, so, so as I said, we can compute, so, so um, when, you, when you do a full loop, uh, you can usually compute the motion in two directions, and that is, that's what's called a loop closure uh, constraint. Um, and uh, ideally, of course, we want to uh, satisfy all constraints that we have found um, equally, and this, this um, can, for example, be done by uh, minimizing um, the error along the whole trajectory just by um, uh, yeah, distributing the, the overall error, you know, the error that is now very large here, to all previous poses. Um, good. And this, this can be modeled as a graph that we optimize, and this is called graph slam. Um, the idea is that every node in this graphs, graph uh, corresponds to a, to a pose um, of the robot uh, during mapping. 
or poles of the camera, uh, as you like. Uh, and then every edge between two nodes corresponds to a spatial constraint between them, an estimate of the relative motion between them. Um, and graph-based SLAM then means that we, that we build such a graph and that we optimize it such that uh, the, uh, the, the error over all constraints that we have is minimized. Um, before we go into the, the math, um, uh, I want to show you this video. Here is a robot that walks around or that drives around in the Intel building. This is a very famous SLAM data set that you might have seen before or that you will see more often. Um, and uh, while the robot goes around, it uh, detects um, um, certain loop closures that's indicated here with these purple lines. And whenever this happens, it can correct the overall map. And you can see how it, how it flips a little bit. Let me maybe go back. So the robot starts at the, in the, initially it's only odometry and then after a while it returns here and then you can see how the map suddenly um, is corrected. Have you, have you seen this motion of the map? And um, the, the more it goes on and on you see that the map shakes a little bit and, and, and this shaking is because uh, it corrects the pose graph uh, by these additional constraints. Good. And for, for finding these uh, loop closures efficiently, uh, you can, for example, use the visual place recognition that we looked at last week, or uh, just, again, brute force matching between previous frames. Good. Okay. And um, typically, or it, it makes sense to structure this mentally into two components when you, when you think about SLAM. Uh, of course, you have the input from the sensor that gives you raw, the, the raw data more or less, and then you have a front end that does the motion estimation and that um, you know, spits out um, um, uh, constraints between camera poses. And then you have a back end that, that maintains the graph and that shifts around the camera poses until all of these um, uh, constraints are satisfied equally. Um, Good. And uh, of course, uh, the better your map is, so, so you, you can't just, or you, you, in principle, you could run the front end um, first and then afterwards run the, the back end. But it, it helps, of course, to find good correspondences if you already know what the map is. So if you have to do visual place search, for example, and you already have a good map, then you know what potential candidates might be you know, in your local vicinity, and you could check them first before you check everything else. Um, good. So. In a more mathematical way, the problem looks as follows. We only are given relative pose observations um, between, between frames. So you have a large set, we have a large set of relative poses, um, of twists, for example, um, between frame i and frame j. And uh, from this, we want to compute a set of camera poses, c1 to cn. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, yeah, that minimizes something uh, that I'll show you in a second. And, um, for the minimization, it makes sense to concatenate all of these camera poses here to one large state vector x, which is super huge. You know, if you have 10 camera poses, then the state vector will have six times n um, different variables. Um, yeah, and this is what we, this is our unknown, this is what we want to find. Good. Um, so to minimize something, we first have to, find, to, have, have to define an error function, and um, this can be constructed as follows. So we, as input, we have an observation set. Uh, between two, between two uh, camera poses and uh, from our current estimate of the map we can compute an expected relative pose that I will denote with set bar um, and that's just the difference between these two poses in our current estimate of the cameras. So initially this could be for example zero. If all camera poses are zero then the expected relative pose would be zero but the observation might be we've actually moved by 10 centimeters. And um, so the error um, uh, between the map and our observations is just the difference um, between, between this observation and the expected relative pose. And this is again a six-dimensional vector then because it you know, says we made in x direction a certain amount of error and in y direction and so on. And um, you know, if we assume that we have the correct map x, um, then this, this error here is uh, purely the result of, um, of the noise that we have in our sensor observations. And usually it makes sense to assume that this error is distributed normally um, um, yeah, with a certain covariance matrix sigma. Uh, it might depend, so, so this sigma might be different for every observation, but if you want to keep it simple, you would just assume that your ICP step has an error of 
one centimeter <laughs> or something, and then you would have a fixed covariance here. But in principle, this could depend um, on whether uh, how far your points are away, for example. You might be super uh, certain about your position estimate when you're standing in a corner of the room and you're moving slightly, um, in, um, in contrast to if you're standing in the middle of the room and all measurements come from much further, then your laser scanner might be less accurate or your camera might be less accurate. Um, Good. So um, this, this allows us now to define an error term. Um, for example, we could compute the, the likelihood of this error, uh, but even more convenient in the mini uh, minimization is to look at the negative uh, log likelihood. So we yeah, take the negative log likelihood of this observation, and um, that is then proportional to uh, the error times the inverse of the covariance times uh, the error, uh, which is just uh, you know, the exponential part of the, the normal distribution. And um, it's important to note here that this error is a likelihood, so it is a scalar value, right? And uh, the, the larger our, our error is, the larger this f here will be. So our goal is to minimize um, this error. And um, now we're not only having a single observation that we want to optimize, uh, for, for which we want to minimize the error, but of course we have a whole set of observations between all of these, uh, for, for all of these uh, relative poses, and we want to minimize the, the sum of all of these terms. And um, yeah, and this is now uh, denoted by a, a large f, which depends on the state vector x. And uh, now our goal is to find the state vector x that uh, yields the minimum error. <laughs> so that mi uh, yields the minimum sum over these individual error terms. And uh, now the question again is how can we solve this optimization problem? Well, we know different methods. Uh, for example, gradient descent. Uh, uh, there is also the Gauss-Newton um, minimization and levenberg marquardt And um, I'll uh, go into detail now into the Gauss-Newton step and briefly touch levenberg marquardt um, Good. So this is something that you should really know um, by heart how this works in, in the axiom. Um, so we, you've seen it before with the KLT tracker, uh, and I guess that you've seen it before in, in the math course, but this is now a really important application of uh, nonlinear minimization and, um, yeah, and also for SLAM. Good. So the idea behind the Gauss-Newton method is that uh, we linearize the error function, um, then we compute its derivative, um, and because we're looking for a minimum, we know that at the minimum the derivative has to be zero. So we set the derivative to zero, and then the solution of this equation will um, hopefully give us the minimum of the error function. So we set the derivative to zero, um, we solve this linear system, um, and, um, yeah, and then we uh, have to repeat this procedure because we linearize the error function and we might not end up exactly at the right minimum, but hopefully close to the right minimum, so we can iterate this. Um, good. So, um, let's start again. This is, this is our error function f uh, that has this form. And um, we want to linearize this, and this means that we pick a certain value x, or uh, you know, the starting point uh, to which we add a small increment, and then we, we try to find an expression that is linear in this um, increment delta x. And uh, before we do that in, in one step, we'll first look at, uh, at this term. This is the error. Um, of an individual um, uh, relative pose observation uh, f from the state vector plus this increment. And um, yeah, we, we can always um, approximate or we can always linearize um, a function, a nonlinear function, uh, using Taylor expansion as follows. So we, we have, we want to know the, um, the error. Um, the uh, error function of x plus this increment, and we approximate it by the error function of uh, the position of x plus the Jacobian times this increment, right? And this, this increment is, of course, as large as the state vector, so it has dimension 6n, and we have a Jacobian that uh, tells us how the error changes when we change the individual components of this x. And remember, this x is uh, a concatenation of all camera poses. And um, so when you form the Jacobian, you have to derive with respect to all cameras. And every camera pose, again, consists of six degrees of freedom. So in principle, you have to derive um, in six possible 
uh, or 6 degrees of freedom for each of the cameras. So this means that the Jacobian is uh, uh, relatively large again. It has, so it uh, outputs you a, a matrix of uh, the size 6 by 6n. Um, now, one important uh, observation here that will help us later to make this uh, map optimization fast is, does the error function actually depend on all uh, state variables in X? And uh, the answer is no, because um, the, um, the error function of a particular relative constraint, of course, only depends on the camera poses of these two of the two involved cameras. All other cameras are, of course, not relevant or don't change this value. And, um, and uh, what does this mean for the Jacobian? Does anybody know? What form can we expect for the Jacobian? Exactly, exactly. The Jacobian will have lots of zeros <laughs> and only be non-zero at the, this, these two locations uh, of the two uh, involved cameras. Um, yeah, good. So um, now when we, when we fill that in, um, um, so, um, uh, then we, and, and we summarize the terms again, uh, we, we um, end up with a linear form um, where we have a certain constant term C that doesn't matter for us. Uh, we have a certain ter term that is linear in X um, so, um, and a certain term that is quadratic in X. And uh, this term B here is, um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. It, uh, yeah, it doesn't help to, to look at that. Um, wait. So in, in the slides on the internet, I, I didn't want to show this slide here, but maybe it makes sense. So if you um, write this out and you have this in the PDF, um, uh, then um, you end up with a very large term and it, it makes sense to, to summarize it a little bit in the, this vector B and um, a matrix H uh, which corresponds to, to the Hessian. And in, in this way you have a really nice form uh, that we can now derive and set to zero. Um, yeah. So again, the, now, now that our function f is actually linear <laughs> in X, um, we, um, uh, can, uh, we, yeah, we can compute the derivative, and um, or it's, it's uh, um, yeah, can compute the derivative and then set this derivative to zero. And it turns out that uh, this derivative has a really simple form, and that it's just h times the increment equals minus b. And um, the only thing that remains then to be done is to solve this linear system of equations. For example, if you would do it in a really brutal way, you could invert this Hessian and uh, directly find um, uh, this increment. Alternatively, you could uh, use Gauss elimination or something to solve this linear system. Um, of course, the problem is that the real function that we try to minimize is nonlinear. Um, so we have to repeat it a few times at different linearization points. And uh, the idea, and this is now the, the core idea of the Gauss-Newton method, to linearize it again and again. So um, uh, first, we compute um, the. So, so, so we, we have an initial estimate of x, and at this initial estimate of x, we linearize, uh, and which allows us to compute this vector of b and the Hessian h. And um, then we solve the linear system, which gives us a certain increment, and then we update our previous estimate by, by adding this increment to, to x. And um, yeah, and that's it. Um, clear to everybody? Good. And, and now um, we look a little bit more again at the, the structure, uh, which uh, makes, makes it possible to solve it quickly. Um, so uh, the, the main problem here is that this uh, matrix H can, gets really, really huge because it has, has a dimension 6 times n times 6n. Um, and you know, if we do it in a brute force way, then we have to invert this matrix. And th this means that even only 100, 100 camera poses, this matrix would already have a size of 600 by 600. And inverting such a matrix is already um, slow. <laughs> and it gets even slower the more poses you get. Um, good. But it's, it's interesting to, to, to look at the structure of this problem. And um, especially given that all the Jacobians that we had are sparse, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, has, uh, this has also an influence now on the, the Hessian. So first, uh, the, the vector b um, is actually the product of um, 
uh, the error term times the in inverse of the covariance matrix times the Jacobian, and the Jacobian is sparse. I indicated this here with these two colors. And this means that the individual uh, bij vector uh, will also be sparse. And um, the more the, the sparsity gets even more extreme, the more camera poses there are you, you have, the more the more of them, <laughs> the, the more uh, parts of B will be will be sparse. And the same uh, happens for uh, the Hessian. So you have this Jacobian vector times the Jacobian vector, and this results in a matrix that's mostly zero, except for at the diagonal and uh, at um, the uh, off-diagonal elements here between I and J. Good. So this means um, for every individual um, component of, uh, you know, for a certain um, uh, relative pose, we have two sparse vectors. But now we have to sum up these individual uh, um, parts to get the real vector B and the real Hessian over all observations. And um, uh, uh, yeah, and this means that when we sum up all of these individual sparse B vectors, we get a dense vector. So there is no. Uh, uh, benefit here, um, but when we sum up all individual uh, Hessians, uh, then we end up with a matrix like this, where we have a full um, diagonal and um, uh, and um, and uh, uh, and certain blocks here in between that correspond to the um, um, relative transformations between uh, two. Uh, camera poses that we have observed, but nevertheless, it means it's 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 again a sparse block matrix with a with a main diagonal, and um, uh, the good thing now is that uh, this this Hessian matrix is. Um, by, by construction, uh, positive semi-definite. Uh, it is symmetric and it is relatively sparse. And these three points allow us to use efficient solvers for this. For example, using sparse Cholesky decomposition, which works for up to 100 million matrix elements. So th this means, you know, that might be this is something like a, a 10,000 by 10,000 like uh, large large matrix. Um, so you could have 10,000 camera poses in it, and it would still be feasible. Um, there are also methods um, that don't explicitly compute the in, in inverse, um, or that uh, don't explicitly uh, split it up uh, um, uh, using using conjugate gradients. And then you can even go up to um, uh, um, uh, one billion of uh, matrix elements. And um, yeah, there are lots of different solvers uh, implemented in linear algebra packages, and um, yeah. Good. Um, before it, um, yeah, we, we lose uh, the, we, we don't see the, the main problem. I, I thought that maybe a small example in 1D helps to understand how this uh, minimization problem looks like. Um, so imagine that we have two camera poses in one dimensional space, right? So it's only a single number. Camera is located somewhere along one axis. And this means that our huge state vector <laughs> has only two degrees of freedom, namely these two camera positions. And uh, we make an observation between them, which is also just the distance uh, along this axis. And now our initial guess is, say, zero for the moment. Both cameras are, because we don't know better, uh, we just put both of them at, to the origin. And then we make the observation that the distance between the two is actually one meter. And um, we assume that our sensor has a certain noise of 0 0.5. Doesn't really matter in this case. Um, so this is our setup. We have two cameras. We've seen one meter distance, but we don't know yet where the cameras are. Good. So we can use that to compute the error, uh, which is just the difference between uh, our observation and our prediction from the map. Um, we observe one meter, uh, and we um, predict zero, because both cameras are located at the origin, which means that our error is one for the moment. Um, then our Jacobian you know, tells us how we expect uh, the error function to change if we move the first camera or if we move the second camera. So if we move the first camera, the error, we expect that the error even increases, of course. <laughs> uh, and if we uh, move the second camera to the right, then we uh, expect that the error decreases. So this is what we will have to do to compensate for, for this error. And uh, now we build up this linear system of equations, um, consisting of only one observation. Uh, gives us this vector b and this vector h. Um, and now we have to solve uh, the system. And um, uh, this does not work. So when you do that, uh, the problem is 
that uh, you can't invert this Hessian because this has a determinant of zero um, or just one degree of freedom. You now, because these two rows are linearly dependent, so you can't invert it. So, what happened here? <laughs> Why can't we solve this? Um, the problem is that um, our system is actually under constraint at the moment. So we want to find two camera poses, but we just have the relative observation between both of them. And um, this means that, that any pose or any two poses would be fine as long as the relative distance is fine. And um, one solution to that problem could be to fix, fixate one of these nodes. For example, by removing it from the state vector, you know, that we only try to estimate the pose of the second camera. Or uh, we could add um, another constra constraint to, to H, for example, to force that the, the update for the first camera should be zero, so that we don't modify this, uh, the, um, the position of the first camera. Or um, um, we could add a dampening factor to the matrix H, uh, which I'll show you later. Um, so, uh, say that we, that we choose for option two, which, which means uh, essentially that we add an additional constraint to, to set the increment uh, of the first camera to zero. Then we get a new, um, new H. And um, by solving this linear system, then we get an update of zero and one, which means we don't move the first camera. We move the second camera by one meter, and we're done. So we've solved the slam problem now for <laughs> two, two 1D cameras. Good. And now there is uh, this levin bach marquardt algorithm, um, which extends it this a little bit. Maybe, maybe uh, does anybody have a question so far? Yes, yeah. Um, well for the normal problem, like 2D, for example, if we, so, so, so the input is every at the set ij always, so the, the relative model. Yes, yeah. From, so if we, we run a circle, and uh, if we have the 10, 10 camera poles, yeah. we, will have, uh, we, will, we have to have 11, uh, sorry, uh, 11, we have to have 11. You have to close it at the, at the very end. And, and the arrow is if the two at the end, the, the one and the tenth mm -hmm. uh, not uh, together. Yeah. Then, so what, what is the error? Is it the input is, is, is just the, the, the relative motor, it's not like yeah. the pulse. Yeah. So if you, if you just have odometry, maybe let me. If there is unfortunately no pen, but if you, if you just have odometry, uh, let me go back here. <coughs> so if, if you just have odometry, you know from from between any two consecutive poses, SLAM can't help you at all because you just don't know, you don't have a redundant constraint. But when it happens that you have at the end another constraint, you know, that, that tells you actually this pose also has to be at a certain distance from the very first mm -hmm. camera pose, then you can optimize all poses using this algorithm. So the constraint now is the relative, uh, relative distance? It's, it's, it's still yeah, yeah it, it's still a relative pose, but now it's a, the relative pose between camera one and camera 15. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and you could ha even have more. Um, I mean, this is a very minimal example where you have one circle and one loop closure. But it could also happen that you have a, a constraint maybe between this and this camera. You know, you could have a very dense, uh, very dense graph. Uh, Christian, Christian Kell will, uh, in, his, in his talk in two weeks, uh, show you a post graph that's really densely connected. Because of course, usually not only, you know, even if you compute odometry, usually you can also compute um, the motion between the first and the third camera. Now, in this case, maybe they don't overlap. But, you know, if, if the cameras are, are um, closely enough together, then, um, um, you, you can add additional edges uh, also between um, cameras that are a few frames apart. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a really nicely meshed <laughs> uh, graph at the end. And that means lots of redundant um, uh, observations. Uh, that, and all of them are individually noisy. But the hope, of course, is that when you minimize then the map at the end, uh, that it um, yeah, distributes the error well. Yeah. So the, the first, uh, for, for the first iteration, exactly. the yeah. is just this uh, between the last uh, red mm -hmm. and black. So 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for example, you would use a normal odometry algorithm, either the, the directly the odometry that you get from the AR drone or from any other um, motion estimation, and and then you need another mechanism <laughs> that tells you that you've been there before with a visual place recognition or any anything that externally that can provide such uh, shortcuts in your in your graph. And when you have enough of them, then hopefully, um, yeah, you can find a nice map. Um, yeah. So, so also here you have there, there you have edges that are forward edges that just encode odometry, and um, there is a second process running in the background that tries to match uh, poses with previous poses, and that adds then these purple lines, and th this is what really helps. At least you need at least one loop closure, but typically you have thousands of loop closures at the end, and this means that this graph can get quite dense and then again this sparsity uh, doesn't hold anymore so um, in practice uh, h again can be very relatively dense and optimization process run every time uh, when we get a new pulse uh, yeah yeah do you have different different um, methods for for doing that you can um, either run um, uh, run it at the very end that's then called batch map optimization some people do that. Um, you can also do it online, that you have after every iteration, uh, you optimize it a little bit. One problem is that the optimi uh, optimization gets slower and slower the longer you go. <laughs> right in the beginning, it's quite fast to, to solve the system of linear equations, but when you have thousands of poses, it might happen that you uh, can't do it um, on every pose, but maybe once a second, and then maybe one every 10 seconds, and so on. But it, I mean, for an online application, it makes sense to do it continuously in the background. And any other uh, questions? Good. So, so one problem is the Gauss-Newton, or one good thing about Gauss-Newton is that it typically converges very fast um, when you have a quadratic error function. Um, however, it sometimes diverges, uh, especially when the initial solution is far off. And that can happen when you assume, for example, that your initial camera poses are all at the origin, uh, you know, like I did in the toy example. Um, uh, then usually Gauss-Newton will uh, will not converge uh, for a for a large thing. So you need to come up with a good initialization somehow. For example, just by using the odometry edges. Um, but but even then, it might happen that that it diverges if the initial map is too too uh, too bad. Um, and um, the observation is that gradient descent in such a case uh, doesn't never diverges. Although it might get stuck in a local minimum, of course. Uh, but gradient descent is guaranteed to um, to optimize, um, uh, yeah, to to improve the, the estimate, because uh, you can always choose a smaller step size, and you're always guaranteed when, that when you follow the the, the, the gradient, uh, that the error function will uh, will get smaller. Uh, the, the error will get smaller. So, and levenberg marquardt is an algorithm that combines advantages of both methods um, by doing the following. So it adds a damping factor to um, this Hessian H, and um, the effect of this is as follows. So if you have a very small lambda, um, then you al almost have least squares or the Gauss-Newton method, right? Then you just have H times the increment equals minus B. However, if you have a very large um, large lambda, then um, this, this, um, um, uh, the, this identity here will dominate this sum. So then the Jacobian here will, you know, um, if, if lambda is large enough, then, then only identity will remain. And then we are actually just following the Jacobian or the, the gradient, um, uh, um, which then corresponds to um, uh, gradient descent. And uh, the levenberg markov algorithm, um, um, uh, uh, does, um, uh, chooses this, this lambda as follows. Uh, if, you, if you realize that the error decreases, you can accept the increment and reduce the lambda to move more towards um, Gauss-Newton. But, but if you, if you uh, notice that the error actually increases, you reject the increment that you computed and you increase the lambda. And in this way, you have a method to, to a blend between gradient descent and Gauss-Newton. And um, yeah, and it, it so it, it increases the robustness, um, but it um, uh, costs a little bit of computation time because generally it converges slower if you do that. Uh, but yeah, at an increased robustness. Good. Um, so for for doing this nonlinear minimization. Um, um, uh, you can, of course, implement your own uh, map solver. 
but there are of course lots of uh, map solvers available that you that you can use um, for example uh, g2o is really popular at the moment um, um, there is uh, also um, uh, yeah, there are also other isam solver from mit um, and recently uh, google published um, their um, uh, solver that they used for google maps uh, which is called Ceres um, as open source and and these things uh, these these um, uh, minimizers uh, do exactly that what you've seen now um, uh, they also can do bundle adjustment that i'll uh, i wanted it to do it today but uh, then i thought that maybe we run out of time and i'll just do it next week um, it's so these solvers are a little bit more general but in principle they minimize nonlinear um, um, uh, least squares problem problems uh, as as, you, as you've seen um, there are also extensions to this uh, solver some of them implement them where you have robust error functions remember the quadratic um, error that we that we have here the, which comes from the assumption of the errors being normally distributed um, might be dangerous if you have outliers in your matches and it's of course clear that when you walk around with a robot for days or for you know if you take 10,000 frames then some of them will be uh, will be wrong and um, then again you could use something like ransack of course or you could have a robust error function and at ICRA there was a whole workshop on robust slam map estimation um, and ways how to do that um, yeah and yeah there are different parameterizations of course of your problem um, for example uh, when you have when you have absolute distances then um, we only have six degrees of freedom and then it makes sense for example to use twists or quaternions and translations um, but when you're dealing with a monocular camera then you don't really know the scale between two images right so an additional degree of freedom that you then have is the scale and you can just treat the scale as any other uh, variable uh, that you have to uh, estimate along so then your map uh, not only has the camera pose but also the camera pose and the scale good um, so this is a video that i found from the Sarah solver uh, from google then this is uh, as i said what they what they use for uh, optimizing the google street view maps so they have the cars uh, with gps and laser scanners and the car drives around and um, estimates the local motion <laughs> uh, also gets edges from uh, from gps that are you know um, like edges between a global um uh, a, a, a node that stands for for the world origin for example for the gps world origin and uh, that links uh, the individual poses along the route and um, yeah and then using this sara solver or g2o you can you can optimize uh, such maps um, so you can see how noisy the initial estimate looks like you know because gps is super noisy and also the motion estimation is noisy uh, but because you have so many redundant uh, observations uh, hopefully the the, the solver um, uh, ends up with the right um, uh, estimate and uh, to to finish uh, for today i wanted to show you another example of, of what we did uh, two years ago um, this is the work of nicolas engelhardt and then uh, later on uh, felix andres so both of them are former colleagues of mine N nicolas um, uh, yeah both of them were originally in in freiburg uh, nicolas is now in, in munich he gave the, the lab course last year um, but now we've lost him to a, to a startup uh, in munich um, but maybe he will return at some point so the idea was as follows um, we we have so this we, we did this this uh, immediately after the connect came out and um, the idea was to use the connect data to um, to build such a post graph and optimize it uh, to get nice uh, three-dimensional models of um, of a room um, and then we participated with, with this approach in the in a, in a, in a challenge uh, in the ross uh, 3d challenge from willow garage and and we won uh, the first prize in the most useful categ category and um, the idea is as follows um, uh, we have we have to connect uh, connect delivers color images and uh, registered depth images and you can think of these depth images just as a point cloud essentially you get a colored point cloud or for every point in the color image you know the distance or you know the depth and um, from this data we want to estimate the camera poses and we want to generate an aligned point cloud that we can display to the user and then an architect for example can use that to measure distances um, so um, uh, the first step um, to in this algorithm was then to extract 2d features so this is now where we try to reduce the enormous amounts of data that we get from the connect we extract like a few hundreds of, of sift or soft features um, 
then um, these uh, features are associated between uh, no uh, are associated with the depth values. So we not only know now the position in the image, but we also know the position of the feature in the 3D world, and um, at certain locations, and um, and then we use uh, Ransack <laughs> to um, estimate the camera motion uh, between the two. This is actually a combination of Ransack and ICP at the same time. So for uh, estimating the for, for running ICP, you need at least three points, of course, because when you have three points in both images, you align them, um, you, you can uh, compute this covariance matrix and then it gives you the rotation and translation. And um, so the Ransack samples three points of this um, and um, estimates the camera motion and then it checks how many inliers we have and then re-estimates the camera motion on uh, the sample set with the largest inliers. So exactly what you've, what you've seen. And, um, and this works really nicely. Uh, this is the PR2 in, in Freiburg. This is Felix. Um, my colleague is scanning. You can see how carefully he is moving the Kinect <laughs> to get the, uh, the best images. And then afterwards, you can see here uh, the, the post graph. It's a bit hard to see. This, these are the white edges. You can see how dense these edges are. You now, when the camera poses are close together, then you can match them in all possible directions, not only along the odometry edge. And then using these camera poses, you can reproject the colored point clouds, and then you get uh, this nice model of the PR2 robot. Um, you can also see here how this how this graph uh, is being built up. Um, it's not only uh, it's maybe hard to see. Um, it's, it's not only a single line for the odometry and one loop closure, but really lots of small edges in between. And and now you know at some point it will happen that this loop can be closed. So it will happen now, and then then you can see how the whole graph moves a little bit and. Um, uh, yeah. So, so when you when you don't do loop closing, you usually see um, double walls then in the in the 3D models at the end, and and by doing this loop closure, you you um, uh, yeah you get nicely consistent models out of it. Good. So to summarize today, we've looked at Ransack um, to um, separate inliers from outliers. We've looked at ICP, a method to estimate the motion in uh, point clouds. And uh, we've looked at the SLAM problem and how to model it in a graph, and then how to optimize this graph. Good. That's it for today. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? No? Good. Then see you next week. <laughs>